Welcome to the planning board meeting for Monday, May 8th, 2017. Uh, thank you to HCAM for hosting us again here in the studio. Uh, obviously, the uh, town hall is still not dried out and uh, hasn't been put back, so our meetings will be here uh, in the foreseeable future. So thank you very much, HCAM, for taping it and providing uh, this wonderful room for it. The agenda tonight is uh, one continued public hearing on the special permit concept plan for subdivision off of Chamberlain and Wayland Street. Uh, and then we have some other small business to be taken up. Uh, I'm going to allow at least a half an hour for that to, to go forward. So we'll probably finish up this hearing. 9.15-ish or so, whatever we're discussing at that particular time. Uh, this is a continued public hearing. All members are here can vote. Uh, if, they, uh, if there's something to vote on, but everyone is eligible to vote. Uh, Except for one member. Which? Brandy Young is not here. He's not here, obviously he can't vote. <laughs> To watch the video. The, um, uh, let me start off with uh, is anyone here that wasn't at our last meeting? <coughs> okay, there's enough. So let's let's. Uh, what you need to, to get through the, the hearing is that uh, there's an outline, and we follow the outline, and it is a public meeting, and there's times that on each of the items that we would will ask for uh, public input. And uh, then usually before we move to the next item, the board will discuss it, come up with some kind of consensus, and then move on to the next item. Maybe we'll have action items or stuff that will uh, require further information at a, at a future meeting. Uh, but basically we want to keep each of the comments just to that part of the outline. And you'll get to talk multiple times here. It's not like town meeting. Uh, but it's on each item. And if you keep your comments into that small sec section, that's kind of what we're, how we're discussing it. We are on the uh, detailed discussion portion of it. Uh, we finished up through the first six items on, on our outline first time around, our first meeting. Uh, we did do a site walk since we were there. The majority members of the board were able to be there and install the site itself. So let's uh, start off again with item 7A, which is the conservation filing. We did get a letter from Conservation Commission. Uh, that was an action item for the last time around. And Jeffy, why don't you talk a little bit about what do you think you got from that? <coughs> so we appeared before the Conservation Commission to have them review our conventional plan as well as the open space plan. The focus was on the conventional plan primarily and the concern around the five wetland crossings that we had proposed as part well, of our we're blocking the camera, plan. I think. Sorry. <laughs> Would you bring it either behind Frank or, or on the other side here? And maybe so people here could see it too. Uh, okay. Yep, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Continue, sorry. No problem. The, the end result, and again, the conventional plan is presented as far as determining the number of lots that would be allowed on the open space plan, since that's our driver. In the end, the Conservation Commission came back, and from a conventional standpoint, although they felt the plan was feasible, they didn't feel that it was necessarily likely to be approved by the Commission. So between that and the additional feedback that we received um, in the memo which came out late last week, uh, we decided to basically take another look at the conventional plan, looking to reduce the number of wetland crossings to see uh, what that particular site plan would look like. So uh, we did not have time to distribute it 
but we did bring copies tonight and we'd like to just go through it a little bit to show you where the changes are as far as reducing the number of wetland crossings, the impact it had on the number of lots, um, and then the subsequent impact on the open space concept plan that we presented as well. And, yeah. We have copies as well that can be shared that we can distribute um, while Mark is going through it. So you have large copies here and I would love to send to you. I have uh, two questions. Um, um, one is an operational question. Um, I need a password so I can do it. Sure. Um, and, and the second is, can you maybe explain the process to the audience? Um, this paperwork is this informational and whatnot. We're just seeing this for the first time. Correct. And we understand that. Oh, Mark Allen with Allen Engineering here representing uh, Paul Mastriani, REC Hopkinton. I'm the civil engineer on, uh, of record for the property. And w what Paul is distributing now are those two concepts that we've. Uh, Mark, you're going to have to speak up just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, no talking, please. Okay, so we're going to have a little bit of audio issues here. So after our conservation uh, commission meeting, and site walk, uh, we took back information and came back with a new scenario, which uh, in the conventional layout reduced the number of lots from 35 lots down to 32 lots. It also reduced the number of wetland crossings from five wetland crossings down to two wetland crossings. And it provided, as before, a through street from Chamberlain to Wayland Street. And that's under the conventional subdivision layout, as shown uh, on the 11 by 17. The second
plan that you have in front of you uh, takes those 32 lots formulated in the conventional layout and puts them into a an open space layout and that layout is the the one which we are, are applying for the special permit for is which to do the open space uh, subdivision so again that is a 32 lot layout and that layout <coughs> does have an emergency access uh, between the two cul-de-sacs that uh, we uh, look to minimize the impact to that wetland crossing itself. Uh, now that we only have the two wetland crossings, uh, that being the biggest, which would be where the emergency access would be, uh, we've pro uh, proposed a 12-foot wide paved access uh, with automated gates at either end for the emergency uh, uh, fire department and police department to access either end of the cul-de-sacs if they chose to. Uh, that would require our wing wall system on either side to minimize the wetland impacts as well as um, uh, minimize the length of, of the wetland crossing. The other item we did uh, upon the site walk is we, we located the uh, old stone foundation that had come up uh, as part of uh, the review from the uh, uh, butters as well as on their site walk. That old stone foundation and well has been shown on both of these two new revised plans. So we have proposed that in the open space plan that that old stone foundation and well uh, be kept in the open space property itself, which abuts the town's property to the north. <clears throat> so overall, the open space area increased by about an acre and a half. Uh, the lots got reduced from 35 to 32, and the number of wetland crossings has come down from uh, 5 to 2. As far as Conservation Commission goes, we, we feel that we have addressed uh, a lot of their concerns. I know this is the first time you've seen it, uh, but just wanted to get you up to speed after last Thursday's comments. The other thing that I'd like to just mention for the record, during the discussions with the prior department regarding uh, driveways, which was part of town meeting, 12 foot for the emergency access road seems to be acceptable for the fire department. And uh, that'll help out, obviously, on the conservation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. portion also. Mm -hmm. And we, we haven't shown this to conservation as of yet. We plan on distributing that uh, tomorrow and letting them see the new revised plans as well. Why don't we talk a little bit about that again? Plans are very similar on the wetland crossings. I guess one is less less square footage, on, on obviously, on the, with the emergency access because you've got a uh, 12, uh, 12 foot instead of a 20 foot thing of surface. Correct. That, that cuts out a lot. Correct. Yeah, that <laughs> takes out eight feet by about 300 feet, so it takes out about you know 250, 300 square feet of wetland alteration. So. Basically, I think when given the letter response we got back, which kind of said, unless you put something in front of us formally, mm -hmm. we're not going to give you an answer. Mm -hmm. and I think this board is looking for the answers. So we would encourage you to file with the Conservation Commission to see whether or not, A, the conventional is permittable, or, and Probably the presumption is if that is still like the open space one significantly more, the right. impacts less than what they're at. So I would go forward with to them with both of these Absolutely. plans. Absolutely. And particularly by the end of the night, maybe there'll be other comments and questions where we might move these around but from a conceptual standpoint. Does anyone on the board have an issue with that approach of requiring a lot of times we have conservation commission going on in parallel with us, and that's always a good good thing. And I think now that some of the options have been narrowed down, I think it's better for, for them to, to focus in on these two plans. I agree, Ken. I, I think that you know um, the conservation commission made it clear that they can't make a determination because there's been no application put before them. And if they can't make a determination as to whether or not, they can't come up to a, um, 
a conclusion as to whether or not it can be approved formally. Um, we need to make sure that uh, we aren't stepping on their toes by trying to push something through before uh, they've had a chance to make sure that they can approve uh, the process. If I may, Frank, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I do think both these plans are an improvement of what we saw previously. Uh, we need to look at it and understand it and get feedback from our experts, of course. Uh, but the conventional subdivision plan <coughs> has a road plan that I think would keep people from driving too fast, uh, which is one of the concerns we have in the other neighborhoods that are affected by this. Um, and I'm a little, I do have a question. I'm not sure if this is a place to ask it at this point. Um, but on the open space plan itself, I thought they were restricted uh, by having two cul-de-sacs that aren't connected uh, to having less buildings be, uh, oh, it is open space, so it's maybe a little bit different than I was thinking, but I thought there was a restriction on how many homes that could be built off of a cul-de-sac off of a cul-de-sac which is, I thought. Well, the, the emergency access takes away the cul-de-sac off the cul-de-sac. Thank you. So that we have, we have two, two means of access to that in an emergency aspect. So, Cliff? Um, I'm just wondering what our bylaw says about the 1,000-foot access point for a cul-de-sac, that we allow nothing over 1,000 feet. With the emergency access road, it's not the only way to get in there. So okay. that's, that's, you know, you, see you can come at it from both ways if fire or police need to come at it. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the, I agree with those comments that the serpentine or the slalom approach, uh, obviously we'll have to have beta make sure that curves and things like that, you know, technically meet whatever standards we are. Uh, and I guess that's an action item on us to, to review to make sure that that conventional actually does work on that. Uh, I'm not sure I see anything on it that that says that it doesn't work per se. And I'm assuming that you've got all the frontages correct. We yeah, we have all the frontages. Like I said, when we, we lost from three lots from 35 down to 32, it gave us a little bit more flexibility uh, to increase the lot sizes and, and increase the frontages. The roads are all designed per subdivision standards. Uh, there would be no waiver requests. Uh, the minimum center line radii uh, per town of Hopkinton is 150 feet, which, is, which was held in the design. <coughs> Office park parcel is that 18 acres is not part of this particular proposal. At this Correct. Time. It's just shown on the. It's yeah. shown as part of the, the land Mr. Mastriani owns, but has not been included in any of the calculations. Okay. Let's let's try to limit ourselves a little bit to the conventional one first. Are there any comments that board members might have on the way up? I just want to reiter reiterate either plan uh, about the office park. If we're not planning now, if, if the owner of that land is not planning now to have access to it, uh, then I'm going to consider that it's going to be landlocked, as we've discussed. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to see something accessing it um, in either plan. Uh, and since I'm already talking, if you don't mind, uh, about the overall conventional plan, I, I think the road safety is, is being addressed. <coughs> and uh, I'm wondering what the uh, neighbors think. Uh, I have to think more about the open space plan. And uh, wasn't there a third option we're also considering? No, we're, down, we're down to two at this point. So the, uh, let's, let's try to keep it on the open space so that if there's any feedback we want to give him as he goes forward with this plan. 
I'm conventional plan. Okay, sorry, sorry. Let's, let's keep it to the conventional plan. I'll say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. So I know you want to keep it to one plan, but this really applies to both plans. Okay. That, um, in my personal opinion, I, I don't like the way that we're building roads without any expansion of connecting other neighborhoods. It's it's something that we we're just going to have all these unique neighborhoods and not connected at all. I noticed that Nancy Road has a little uh, turnout there for a possible connection of a future um, road connecting to it. But here, with conventional plan, there is no way if you wanted a, a road coming in from the north or the south, you know, to, you know, to those neighborhoods or even to the neighborhoods off of Lumber Street of Montana. Well, I, I know that the, the folks that are here tonight will probably look down upon that, but as far as the, the outlook of the town, we should really think about being able to connect neighborhoods. So, well, I, let's kind of answer that in a, in a different way. Sure. Uh, the town of Hopkinton land, which is the high school fields, it's got an open space, it's protected, you can't go <laughs> to the top part of the page. Uh, the brides want to keep their drive private. <coughs> So, uh, you know, there's no way from the top can we connect. The views itself is pretty well locked on its own from the other side, and certainly, you know, we're not looking forward to a, a, a through road through the middle of an apartment complex, because that's not even being run as a town street per se. Uh, so I, I, I don't <coughs> think there's much opportunity to go anywhere else. Uh, I guess somebody could buy the Instar property, but we, the town has looked at that and it's only I think, a couple hundred feet wide. So it was an old right of way that they were trying to do. Uh, and you'd have another set of wetland crossings. And we've already heard what the conservation committee does. So basically, I think the office <coughs> park is most definitely landlocked. And you know we'll probably end up somehow being part of the open space uh, behind views behind this area. Um, yes, I, I and, and you know you've got the Rod and Gun Club on the, on the other side, and, and while well, you uh, might you know that that organization, I think that their their, their bylaws are set up. There's no way that they're, they're going to shut that. Valuable piece of property down for right. So, so I, I don't I don't think you can I don't right. think you can get there, but your other you know concerns are probably the right way of thinking about this. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know I know that you know we always seem to focus on the development at hand. We never we, we could do a better job of you know thinking about the town as a whole. I understand we don't want this as a free street with a lot of traffic, but as far as connecting neighborhoods. That, that's something that we should strive to for in the town. Thank you. If I may, through the chair, to Mr. Paul. Uh, it's not on these uh, charts, but the developer has indicated he's interested in continuing the paths that are there and through there, uh, which connects neighborhoods. Are you talking about the trails? Yes. No, I was speaking to roads. Well, when you get to the conventional plan, though, there isn't, you know, all the trails will be on somebody's house lot. So basically, they go away at the conventional plan. Plan. So that's why they're not on this one. That's right. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask that. You know, I, I, I'm assuming they go away. I mean, mm -hmm. you're building you know, a house on it, they yeah. go away. There is no open space in the conventional plan, so there's no public land. It's all private, so we do not continue the trail system. Mm. So let's, let's now maybe focus on the um, open, space. open space plan. <coughs> I know everyone's just had a shot at looking at it. Uh, I'm going to start it off with looking at Colossac C and the and the bulb that's right there at the end of emergency access. If you got rid of I'll say the ball that's on the emergency access and just bent the road to go into C, would you have pretty much the same thing without 
a lot more extra pavement there. Awesome. Uh, and still get the frontage, maybe? Yeah, I'd have to look at the frontage to make sure it works, but that uh, that is a possibility. Because it almost seems that, that, I mean, there might be a, uh, a reason to have that second bulb is, I'll say, a parking overflow for the trail that goes right into that area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can kind of see that might be a, mm -hmm. a nice feature, but it is paving a little bit more road. Mm -hmm. I would second that suggestion. I think it's a good idea. Uh, yeah, I can absolutely take a look at that. Just leaving one cul-de-sac at the end of Road C and maybe doing a 150-foot radii uh, turn to get up into it. Something like that, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if it works. Mm -hmm. My other comment would be maybe you can increase the space around the old foundation and well because mm -hmm. that's kind of... You know, I'm not sure how it is to scale, but you know, you got to be able to kind of appreciate it without yeah. stepping on somebody's backyard. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think we're at about 10 feet now. Um, let's let's open up the uh, other planning board members have stuff to talk about on this conventional or open space plan. If I may, Ken, through the chair, that, yeah. that second bulb may be a nice turnaround for the school buses, though. Where well, you'd have the other bulb, right? Well, you would, but the road would access it, which would create a, well, it would create another entrance to it. Just thought it'd be easier if you had just a turnaround, separate turnaround for the bus instead of having to go down and around. I don't know what the schedule looks like, but no, follow the that. bus would have to follow down the second mm -hmm. the second turn versus with the with the first the second bulb the original the one Ken wants to remove he would just turn around there to come straight back down the street. Yeah, it's really a matter of is that really worth all that extra pavement? I mean, well, it's also as he pointed out though it's there. it's a great great parking for the trails as I well. I like the idea of the parking. But I mean, you I mean if you want to connect the neighborhood, people are going to walk that that road. But but with that parking, um, won't we be obstructing the the emergency access? Well, if you if park. you stripe it, but the hope is the emergency yeah. access wouldn't yeah. need. You'd hope people wouldn't park in front of somebody's yeah. like drive. There would be a gate that would say no yeah. parking. <coughs> I would guess. And, and did you mention that there was an electronic gate that? that yeah, we pr propose an automated uh, type uh, system for the emergency access vehicles. Yep. So the, what you're proposing is it's only controlled by the vehicles, the drivers in the vehicles. Yeah, the emergency, uh, emergency. fire and police. Yeah. But like they change the, the traffic signals, right. and then the uh, snowplow operator would have uh, a device so that he can go through it and open it and shut it while he's plowing. So that you know there was a lot of concern that that during the winter time they would leave it open, and you know that would kind of defeat the purpose of it. And, I know the DPW does not want to get out of their truck and open the gate and shut the gate, et cetera. So it'd be kind of like a toll toll booth gate. Probably could get a few extra surplus ones from there. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe too late now. Yeah. The, um, the other thing that the open space plan seems to do is with the 12 foot wide and there'll be restricted land on both sides, uh, open space conservation, that road cannot then be um, widened in the future as a through road. So that would basically take care of those concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any comments to the conventional or the open space plan by members of the public? Hi, Gary Trendle, 31 Chamberlain Street. I have a, a couple of questions just for clarification, and I have a, a broader question about the master plan for uh, the planning board. Um, on the conventional plan, I'm just curious, and I don't know what the bylaws specifically say, but there is a, a shared driveway. Is that permissible um, yes. in the conventional? Yes. Okay. In fact, it's uh, allowed for conservation reasons, so yes. this one actually meets the intent of the bylaw. And yes, we, we allow two 
two houses off of a shared driveway. Okay. With a special permit, I believe it is. Yes. Okay. Um, and then second question about the conventional. Uh, I noticed that it, it, it does put a, looks like a house over the, um, the historic cellar. Um, I don't know if that has any uh, implications at all, but no one made a comment on it, so. It, we, on conventional property, it's kind of, we have a hard time protecting that type of stuff. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. legally, that's where they're at. But we might okay. discuss that a little bit more later on if, if conventional was going on forward, but you know, it, it does look like it's in the middle of the house. Okay. Um, and then on the open space, I, I, I applaud them for the, the design with the, the narrow connection, and, and I think that, that as a neighbor, um, you know, particularly if we can um, protect the land around it, I think that's um, desirable for us. But um, a comment or a question back to, to Mr. Paul about, um, about the, the, the connectivity or connecting neighborhoods. Um, as I read through the, the master plan, uh, I'm a little bit confused because on one hand it says we want to connect neighborhoods, on the other hand it says we want to preserve existing neighborhoods, it references so that, that, that uh, dead-end streets are desirable places to live for families, and, and so I, I guess I'm just looking for some clarity uh, from the board on the master plan as to, to how we weigh um, preservation or protection uh, of existing neighborhoods versus versus this idea of, of connectivity because it seems conflicting in the in the, the master plan. I think you're right. It is probably conflicting, and that's kind of almost no piece of land is the same in Hopkinton anywhere. So that's where I think the judgment of the planning board folks individually and listening to the public that are before us come up with a. An answer. I'm not sure we have one one way or not. I know when they are developing some of the subdivisions along Ash Street, they were trying to at one point do a uh, connecting parallel road on Ash Street behind it in the subdivisions. Uh, planning board was working really hard on that until they built the gas pipeline over there, and they screwed up all the grades and they couldn't make it work. So then you ended up with a lot of in and out type subdivision, one call the sack way back when. So, Thank you, Mr. Chair, yep. just to add on to that. So, that is great input, and we, we look for that input into the master plan. Um, but just to let you know that the style of the town has changed, right? Over because of all the folks coming to town, one of them is that um, sidewalks are not preferred paths, that we just wanted country roads. So, that's something else that is changing. Um, and we'd also have to, in my opinion, I mean, that was my personal opinion, not what um, Master Plan suggested, but connecting neighborhoods is something that we should discuss throughout the Master Plan and see if that's something we want to move forward with as a town. So thanks for pointing that out. Thank you. More public comment. Meet the candidates. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Future candidates. Don Cavaney, 14 Whalen Road, and uh, I guess I'm briefly kind of repeat some of the comments I made a, the last time we were here, and I, I'm still a believer that um, these two cul-de-sacs can be extended and maintained even without the limited, um, you know, the limited road, the limited cut through, the limited emergency access part of it. Um, I did take another look at Elaine Lazarus's memo from, I think it was 2019. 1996, but was updated in 2015. And Penny Main, Pe Penny, Penny Meadow Lane, Christian Estates, Hayden Place, 30 North Mill Street, are just a couple of the examples from 1997 to 2015, where this board has found exceptional circumstances. And if you look at the memo and look at the, the examples that um, this board found met exceptional circumstances, I, I think again what Mr. Mastriani is donating to the town. Uh, far exceeds anything that was donated to the town or to the state in um, these prior developments where um, exceptional circumstances were found. So I do, um, I haven't given up on this board yet, so I, I'm going to again re uh, request that you uh, don't make that decision, don't make your mind up quite yet on, um, on go as much as again I appreciate Mr. Mastriani cutting down to 12, that's, that's certainly far better than 20. Um, but I'm, I'm still looking for a little bit more because, I, again, I think um, 
I think we can make this work with extending those those cul-de-sacs and and I think the exceptional circumstances have been met so thank you can I ask you what's what's the problem with a 12-foot emergency access I think that would make both neighborhoods more safe um, well I, I guess as much as I appreciate I, I guess I appreciate um, the intent of keeping it to, to 12 feet and uh, how does how do you expect to ensure specifically ensure that it, it the 12 feet doesn't get to 14 feet doesn't get to 16 because, feet doesn't get to 18 feet because the open space ends up permanently protected and there'll be a, uh, a either the town will hold it and there'll be somebody that'll hold a conservation restriction on it and you won't see anything put on that piece of property you, you won't be able to physically make it white and you know we'll put the conservation restriction up to like a foot of the of the, of the wing wall uh, you know we want the wing wall to, to you know to be on the town's property because you know it might need to be repaired in 50 years or 100 yeah, so years so if I could that, that entire um, emergency access uh, 12 foot wide pave and the wing walls would all be part of the open space deeded to the town and, and the conservation restriction be held by a third party. Uh, so either that or we keep it as part of the roadway. I'm not, I'm not sure. We'll have to legally look at that. Okay. In either case, uh, it, it will be deeded as a separate parcel and through this special permit process, if, if in perpetuity we want to put some language in that that open space shall never be subdivided, further subdivided, uh, yeah. the applicant would have it actually expects that. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I just know that just that, you know, special permits, have, you can always come back and do amendments, and things that have been done can always be undone. And, and that's just, I guess it's out of the height, height of, um, uh, of, of sure. it's that. It's just one. The conservation restriction usually takes an act of the legislature to, to undo them, so that's that's a fairly tough bar. That sounds pretty high, yeah. And you have to get a town, <laughs> meeting, you have to get a town meeting vote okay. to go to the legislature, so that selectman can't, you know, it'd be the selectman doing it on the behalf of town meeting, and then it's an act of the legislature, special act of the legislature. And uh, I'm not sure. I don't know the state that they've ever done that on a conservation restriction. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm, I'm feeling. That's why we're, we're pretty careful before we put them on. Okay. But that's great. It's just, I, I was trying to convince you. You're starting to convince me. That's <laughs> well, I, I mean, that that's kind of why we like these subdivisions because it concentrates on smaller lots and allows the trails and allows the historic stuff and that's the whole purpose of yeah. this particular area. Okay, Mr. Chair, just a couple of comments in support of that, that uh, cut through road, not cut through road, but access road. Um, one thing to me that supplies handicap access between the two neighborhoods. I mean, uh, maybe you were envisioning a trail through there, but having a paved area allows handicap people with strollers. Oh, and bike path. Bike path. And secondly, I would think that if we didn't have that access road, that there would probably be houses on the end of that cul-de-sac and you wouldn't be able to get through without going across on somebody's property. So that's just a couple points I wanted to make in support of that access road. All right. Carol? Go well, through the chair. Oh, oh, go, oh go, go ahead. Thank right. you. A uh, question for Mr. Cavani. Um, I know you've just seen these and off the top of your head. Oh, I'm a little confused. Which of these were you preferring? Uh, oh, I was uh, preferring, um, well, preferring the, the, the op certainly the open space, but with the cul-de-sacs as they're shown without the access road, but the, the open the space, bridge. yeah, the open space plan is certainly more acceptable and, and um, safer. So certainly lesser, much lesser of two evils. So I'm a little confused uh, why there is not a plan without a bridge, without anything connecting, because I don't remember that being... Uh, dismissed at all, or is that just not what the developer right now is wanting? Or? That wouldn't meet. Wouldn't meet our. Then you'd have a cul-de-sac on top of a cul-de-sac. We wouldn't meet, the, you know, the thousand-foot rule. So none of that would. That wouldn't meet the thousand-foot rule. So right. I don't think we can approve it. And there's only ten ten houses on that thousand feet too. So. So I can see why. The developer now, Carol. Okay. Um, Carol Dever, 47 Chamberlain Street. And first, I apologize for being late, so if, if I'm being redundant, please correct me. Um, my, and I, let me preface this with, I like this plan considerably 
better than I've seen the other plans that have come through. My <coughs> issue with the access road between the two would be that in, in one section of the traffic report that I read, I think it said that the access road has to be open all winter for plowing. Oh, we, we, we've got them to put an electronic gate on each side. Okay. So the snow plow operator can raise it up. So we get, we, we put, we did, we took care of that one. Okay, that's great. My other question is a process question. I read the um, Conservation Commission uh, response to your request and your questions, and I'm I'm just asking how you can proceed with this process without having a formal evaluation by the Conservation Commission because yeah. it's. And, and you're being a little redundant because we. I apologize. Already, we already decided that they're going to go submit both to the Conservation Commission and ask for Excellent. their opinion. Excellent. Thank you, and again, I apologize for no, being no, late. No, it's good. That's okay. Good questions. Always good, questions. Hear, always good to hear them a second time. <laughs> yeah. Good questions. Yes, sir. Hi, Luke Name Tedstone. Luke Tedstone, 49 yeah. Chamberlain Street. Can someone tell me where the um, width of the access road, the 12-foot paved emergency road, came from? The uh, driveway uh, bylaw that was just passed at town meeting is basically sets uh, the 12-foot width and if it's good enough for that part of it uh, we had some discussions uh, with the fire department and if it's good enough for that it's good enough for this okay and uh, second question in terms of a hundred and fifty foot turning radius can someone give me an idea of how that will work from existing to the new area at the end of Chamberlain I don't understand your question I'm sorry so just kind of a layout maybe sure. um, a projected oh, I think are you talking about the right turn coming in to the yeah the yes that, that would be a, just a standard right turn yes, yes, yes. so a right angle turn <clears throat> right sure. yes it's almost like you wouldn't call that Chamberlain Street perhaps talking about in here just at the end of the yeah. exactly, exactly. Right here so yeah so right now uh, your driveway ends here we'd have to have a minimum of a hundred foot radius to get uh, into this property here which would is a minimum town standard for safe vehicular traffic, which okay. is what we was proposed. And so that's a like kind of a, a ballpark essentially of how it would be. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Thanks. I'm not sure I understood that one. <laughs> you, you're just like stopping and turning right at that point. It'll be a, it'll be a 150 foot radius to get to make that turn. And you can get that in the existing property line within the. The easement and the property lines, yes. Yeah, we're going to work work within the right of way of of what's out there. Through you, through you Mr. Chair, just say, make sure you're aware where the stone walls are Correct. on each side. Correct. So that, that being the case, that end of Chamberlain isn't necessarily 20 feet wide at any any juncture uh, near there. So it's going to be a, maybe that'll be a traffic calmer just <laughs> in itself. Correct. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good evening. Deputy Miller, Hopkinton Fire. I'm struggling, Ken, a little bit with how we're coming up with a 12-foot wide access road. You're comparing it to a driveway. How does a driveway compare to an emergency road with only being 12 feet? If I remember correctly, your testimony last time was that we didn't need, from a fire standpoint, two accesses. We had said if we were going to put an access in, we'd like to see it be 20 feet so we could get our apparatus through with a 12 foot wide road. And I believe the code says something like, and I'm paraphrasing it, you can do the 20 feet or the best possible. And what I think we're saying is 12 feet's the best we're gonna get through Conservation Commission. It's the same width as what a driveway would be. I would hope that if you were going through there, you can get a fire truck through on a 12 foot wide piece of road. You can get a fire truck through a 12 foot piece of wide road, but if something happens where we're dropping a feeder line or a supply line to the back side of the neighborhood, we won't be. It's gonna close that 12 foot wide road down and we're not gonna get any of the apparatus through at that point. The 12 foot wide is really gonna restrict us to there with our apparatus if something happens. If that access is blocked, we won't. And it's happened on Whalen Road already last year. Where we had a telephone pole, a tree come down, take the pole down, which limited us access from the beginning and all the houses at the end, we couldn't get it to for hours. So this is what we look at. 
to you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Just a kind of a related question. Mm -hmm. So is your preference to have that access road versus not having it? Because there was some... We're not, uh, we're not advocating for either way. But if the board approves or decides, whatever the board decides, and they want to put an access road in, okay, again, the fire department's not going to comment either way. But we're asking that that road be wider if that's what the plan is, because 12 feet really restricts us with our apparatus. And again, if we have to drop a feeder line through there for water supply for something on either side, that right. road is shut down. I, I understand the width concerns. I just, yeah. my question is we, we, the, the yeah. presence of the access road or not, because to me, if some of your equipment is over on West Main Street or some of your personnel is out in the vehicles, it's going to take them a really long time to get there to go all the way around town and come in from Chamberlain Street. So that access road would seem very beneficial to the fire department. We have multiple divisions in town where we have to work that way now as it is. So again, I will go on record and say we're not advocating for either way. Okay. Our would, point at this point is public safety. How do we get in? I would, I would just like to point out to the chair. Sorry. That Go ahead, Cliff. There's almost, oh, 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 well, just oh, to finish up, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. His response that, for me, I'm not by no means a public safety expert, but if I could have a shorter way to access a neighborhood, that I would advocate that. That's just my point. Okay, thanks. Mr. Chair. Okay. Well, Cliff, while you're up there, if, if I may, yeah. mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend from your standpoint on a, 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 a a certain amount of footage road. Uh, uh, with Cliff, is that what you're asking? Please, yes. Again, our 580 CMR1 states, states at least 20 feet. Okay. And that allows us to get, again, put a feeder line in the road if we need be for yep. water supply. Yep. And if we have to get two pieces of apparatus by, if we're doing a tanker shuttle or anything like that, we're still able to get two pieces of fire apparatus by at right. one time. Right, I wanted Not that limited. to be clear on, on okay. what, what, we're, what we're posing here or what mm -hmm. we're even contemplating. Brian, through the chair, two points. When we're developing a neighborhood, we wouldn't be putting water in the neighborhood? I don't know what the plan is for this at this time. Okay. That's something that's and going to have to be worked out with the water department. The is the emergency access road that we just approved earlier this year to the new marathon school mm -hmm. is far less than 20 feet. 18. 18. Not much less. I thought it was 16. Still less. No, I just looked okay. that up. It's 18. Yes. So, no, it's okay. Point, okay. No, I think... I think if, if there was town water that went through there, so that the whole thing was, you know, with the, with the town water, would your concerns be less about the width? I still think that's something we need to discuss with the water department before we make any, any comment on that. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's a good point. Could I ask uh, the chair, yeah. whose responsibility is it for uh, putting fire hydrants? Is that a town obligation or a developer obligation? The developer or? is required to put the... If, if he's approved for town water, he puts in all the infrastructure, including the hydrants. And the hydrants are like every, I think, four or 500 feet. And if, if you can probably remember from your role as water commissioner, uh, does Chamberlain and Wayland both have water? Yes, they have water all the way to the end. I think one is a six inch line and one is a eight inch line. Thank you. If I remember correctly, and that's going back a few years. Your question. Um, with regards to that, while you're there, um, is are we talking about runoff and in, in included in this and catch basins and what what goes on with that road if it um, because it's a, it's going over wetland? It will be designed according to stormwater things, and we'll get to that in a little bit. That's further, further out on the outline. Okay. Well, I just want to I just want to make sure that that we're you know if we're bringing in water and there's an incident where there's a, a house fire or something else like that, and all that water that is going to use to, to, to extinguish that, where does all that water run into, and what does it run into? And that's into the ground. Well, I, again, I, I understand that, but um, you know, usually there's catch basins down on roads and, and so forth, and I'm, I'm more concerned about the, those wetlands that we're, that we're abutting. I'm sure every time we have an emergency like that, People are very concerned about what goes in, and you know, if we have spill responses and things like that. Are part of our. Say. I have a question yeah. for Chief Deputy Chief to the Chair. Yep. Um, I hear what you're saying 20 feet. I, mm -hmm. I do remember you guys discussing that before. Um, so the. Uh, Conventional plan shows a regular 20-foot wide street 
uh, and with a crossing uh, over the same wetland. Uh, I guess we're aware of any weight restrictions for the for the uh, trucks. But I guess and maybe it's not a question for you so much as a, as a developer or as a point I want to point out that maybe the uh, smaller access road might be uh, have to be built to the same standards to hold a fire truck. Um, yeah. And it just feels to me an access road is half the equation and uh, it doesn't seem to really answer the full question of uh, public safety uh, and uh, the same number of houses are on the plans either way. I'm, um, as a former member of the Conservation Commission, sure there's hundreds of feet, square feet less with the access road being 12 feet wide, but there are different uh, calculations for wetlands, as Phil Paradis is here. Uh, a bridge is less intrusive than uh, most other things that can go into a wetland. So I'm thinking in, in concerns of public safety, I feel more comfortable with 20 feet. Uh, just uh, access road or not, it just seems to be uh, this build is safer now than regret it in the future. My opinion. Too bad I think that 18 feet would be if sure. we're putting it somewhere else, 18 feet would probably be um, a little bit more lenient. If, that's, if that works better. Um, and again, it, it is public safety, but um, I, again, we can't, what are we What are we basing any decision on right now because we're still waiting on CONCOM. So anybody out there looking into it, you know, there's a lot in front of us. Um, so this is just subjective at best right now as we move forward. I just will restate, I'm very comfortable with 12 feet for where it is. I suspect we'll have uh, town water for this. I know I've talked to the DPW director. He has a desire to loop the water system, which is one of his kind of goals. So <coughs> that isn't to say it's a favorable decision on his part, because he hasn't doesn't have an application in front of him, but it sounded like looping the water system would be a goal, which would then put fire hydrants over on the entire thing. Okay, thank you. Okay. If I could, yeah. excuse me. Um, I do think we need some direction from the planning board as to the width of the road, because that will drive our application and how we go before conservation committee. So whether we go in with 12 and they approve this and then we come back and the board says, no, they want 16, you want 16, 18, or 20, if we could get that direction. Well, you're, you're, kind, of, you're kind of getting it both ways because we're asking you to do both the conventional, which does a 20-foot crossing. Mm -hmm. So you, you've, got that, you've got that answer, too. And then you've got the 12-foot 12, the 12 crossing also. Yeah, from, from the last meeting, <coughs> we were told that um, the planning board sets the bar as far as design and safety, public safety goes, and then conservation reacts to their application uh, once the planning board determines what what the infrastructure looks like. So that, that's kind of where we're at now. We were pretty close before. Uh, I, I think we just need to, to nail it down and then uh, get conservation's input. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to go forward with 12 feet. And then if that passes, then... Point of order? Yeah. Um, is it more of a consensus that they're asking for than an actual motion? Well, I don't know how else to... I mean, we're kind of showing hands one way or the other. So maybe not a motion, but maybe... Well, well I could recommend, yeah. the, as, as Cliff is getting to, a, a question that they're asking for a consensus that's maybe not necessarily binding as a motion would be. Is that correct? Well, I don't know how binding it is. I mean, it's, it's an expression of the will of the board at this particular time. We are not tonight approving a subdivision here, right. and given the uh, fact that all... That kind of, you just heard the deputy chief recite um, fire regulations that require them to be 20 feet, so I would just caution the board of taking any vote in violation of any other state, federal, or local regulation. 
To that point, Ken, wasn't there a meeting we had once where we discussed putting the chief wanted sprinklers in the houses, depending upon the width of the driveway? Yeah, that, that by law, or that state law got changed and is now, uh, it was such a, for uh, single family houses and duplexes, it doesn't apply. But sprinklers would be required for a, a triple or something. Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, Bob Burke, 11 Whalen Road. I've heard several planning board members mention public safety as uh, a necessity for, <coughs> for the cut through. Um, yet the fire department has said that they're taking no position, uh, not advocating either way for, for, this, for this cut through. And given the issues with the width of the road, um, some of the issues with the Conservation Commission, I do wonder, and we'll reiterate a question, a, a point that was raised earlier, why are we not still looking at the double cul-de-sac uh, situation when we have uh, neighbors who would prefer that, a developer who I believe said last time that he would accept that, um, a fire department that's taking no position on the cut through, a conservation commission that would clearly prefer to have not a big crossing or a little crossing, but, but no crossing. And so I, I wonder why the, the no cul-de-sac plan. Because we have a no cul-de-sac Rule. We have an exceptional circumstances clause that would seem, as Mr. Caveney has pointed out, uh, would seem to provide a kind of an easy exit ramp from, from that bylaw. It's been done many times. Uh, there is a very significant wetlands crossing there, and it would seem as though the exceptional circumstances clause could be applied here to go and take two neighborhoods that have been cul-de-sacs for a very long period of time and allow them to remain as cul-de-sacs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Quite a blur, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, we never answered Kathy's question. Should I know. We just, I know. We're, we're, we're in the process of, of, of getting to the width of the... Of the okay, but to my point, are we only entertaining questions related to the access road at this point? Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. We're, we're trying to... I also just want to point out, I don't believe the exceptional circumstances applies to 1,000 feet and 10 house slots and open space. That only applies to subdivision regulations for no call to staff. Not in the, the exceptional circumstances, stances is not referenced in the bylaw for open space. It's only referenced in your subdivision regulations. Right. So I don't think that applies for the thousand. So is that okay? No, it's not okay. <coughs> so, Teresa, Mr. Chair, I'm just trying to understand Jen's point there. So it's only allowed with a conventional right. subdivision and not an open space. The conventional subdivision showing cul de sacs. They could use exceptional circumstances to approve that, could, but under open space, it doesn't give you that option under the bylaw. I think that answers the gentleman's question of why you feel that the. Yes, Besides, yeah. it, it, it is a. Uh, there's already a lot of houses on a dead end. And, and then, you know, we don't like to do that. Okay, so now we're still talking about the width of the. Emergency access road. Through the chair, um, I think it has to be 20 feet either way. Um, I agree uh, with what Jennifer was reading uh, to us from the regulations, and um, if it's going to be, if there's going to be a bridge. Uh, if it's going to be over the wetlands, it's going to be, might as well be 20 feet uh, just as easily as 12. Um, water still would flow underneath it. Um, so th again, those, those calculations about wetland disturbance are different for bridges than they are for other things. Um, well, uh, if we're going to give many guidance. That it's, it's wants to minimize, I would think, the bridge concept because we're not looking to maintain a bridge in 50 years, you know, maybe long gone before this board is going. <laughs> Mr. Chair, for clarity on that? Yeah. Can we get some input as far how how long the bridge would be versus the actual access road? Like what percentage it's, of it? It's, you look at this, it's the same. Bridge road. Well, I just like to hear a studio line. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question. But just, is, according to the picture, it looks like the bridge is 50% of the access road. Is that roughly accurate? Uh, maybe a third. No, it's, it's uh, over yeah, a third. The actual bridge itself is probably about a, a, a little less than a third. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not sure that's a bridge either. 100, 100 feet. 
is, is that a bridge of 100 feet? Or no, that's the, that's the span of the wetland crossing itself from one wetland border to the other wetland border. The actual stream channel is only a few feet wide, so the, there'd be a, a box culvert designed uh, more or less, and the box culvert would be four to six feet wide by two or three feet tall. So, and then that box culvert, which would carry the water, would be supported by wing walls to, to build up the roadway above it. In, in both instances, so conventional and? In both, correct. Okay. In order to try to minimize the impact. So the same design criteria we would hold, uh, it would just be a matter of physically where those wing walls, it'd be eight feet shorter if it were 12 feet as opposed to 20 feet. So it would be similar to uh, Stony Brook. Uh, well, the and views, also the, the views had one installed as part of their wetland crossing as well. Very, very similar. That's wider and longer. I thought it is it's not as long but it's just as wide it was a very short crossing uh, this is a very a, a, a much wider crossing I have a, I have a question we look, we still have someone on, on point there's a question go ahead so my question goes back to, uh, I guess, the 18-foot emergency access road that was built at the school. Why would we not be allowed to approve a lesser than 20-foot access road? Yeah, that's what I was it. Fully involved in that project? Uh, so I don't know the answer. The fire chief helped me with that one. I believe on the, in that case, too, there are some um, um, fortified um, like landscaping on the side where the trucks can drive along the sides as well. So I don't know if they take that into consideration. I think the paved width is only 18 feet, and then the, the landscaping is like fortified underneath so that they can get all the way to the trucks. So it may be a 20 foot that the trucks can drive over, but it's only 18 feet paved. Yeah, we, have, we struggled with that one. Right. You did. Who did? Mm -hmm. The other thing, though, that one was existing. I remember exactly right because that's the access that goes to EMC Park. Isn't that mostly existing? No, no, no there's no, there was no access. Well, there's already a trail there. But yeah, but it was the secondary exit. I, I still think we only need 12 feet. I just don't think we need. Well, that all, all, all to that point. Can, that if, if we get the water in there, then yes, <coughs> I, I totally agree with that. To you, Mr. Chair? Yeah. I don't think we should, to Jen's point or anything, um, without the approval of the fire department. So if we do get a width with less than 20 feet, whether it's 18 or whether it's 12, I would like to see if um, they would approve that. Right. The same way they did the school. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mr. If I could, through the chair, uh, just the essence of, of time and, and process, knowing that this is a part one of a two-part process, this being the special permit, we're looking at uh, sort of a 40,000-foot view. We're looking at conventional versus open space. I think I think the open space is sort of the consensus is that's the way we want to lean. Maybe this discussion as far as the, the, the width is more in tune for the definitive subdivision design and analysis when we can get real hard <coughs> numbers together. I think at this point, you know, it, it's either conventional or open space. Uh, and that could be a, a table discussion for, for, for width during the definitive, just mm -hmm. a suggestion. If, if I could answer that to the chair. Um, it, it seems like it's, it's also a bottleneck, though, so it's a very important <coughs> topic to get in front of right now because if it's, yeah, we're, we're working with the Conservation Commission, we're, we're working with you, working with the neighbors, but we want to have a consensus and an understanding where we're, where we're getting to. Yeah. And if we're if 12 foot doesn't work, then well, we're 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 going to get the answer from Concom what anyway on any crossing. We're we're, we're going to get a 20 foot answer because if they would rule that they would not give two 20 foot crossings, there the conventional plan doesn't work, and therefore there's no lots right. available. Right. So 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 we're getting that answer. So maybe we turn table this yeah, discussion I, at this point and, and, and try to solicit more input from the fire department and get something more from the and, and wait this response from Tom. Right. Said. 
but I still, I'm not convinced that 12 feet doesn't get us to what we really need to do for the reduced. So, so thanks to the point of, to this point, everybody's time here, maybe we should move on and come back to that. So I'm hearing your point that we need more information and more time to consider it. Gary? Just make one more quick point. Sure. Just going back to the master plan in terms of preserving neighborhoods and providing connectivity. Um, a 12 foot access road gives connectivity for bicycles and pedestrians and it also helps preserve existing neighborhoods. So whether it's 12 feet or 14 or 16, as long as it's something less than 20 feet, then I think that we as, as neighbors would, would, would be very supportive of it. Excellent. Okay, so let's go down through the outline. We kind of talked a lot about item C at this point, but it's still wide open. We're on to D. Let's kind of let's try to understand on a baseline where the traffic area is, and, and basically, I guess we're we're, we're talking to. Can somebody kind of give a traffic summary on, say, the conventional plan, and then a traffic summary on the open space plan? Hi, good evening. I'm Dan Dumas with MDM Transportation. We did a traffic study for this project. We looked at both the uh, conventional plan and then the uh, emergency access only plan. So this just gives you a layout of our, our study area. You look at West Main Street with Wayland, which is one access, Chamberlain, Route 85, the other side, and we looked at Pleasant Street at 85 and Pleasant Street at uh, West Main in terms of um, if people were going to cut through the neighborhood to get to 85 to West Main, if that was a possibility, we need to look at that. So we went out and collected our data um, during the weekday morning, 7 to 9, and weekday evening, 4 to 6, um, January 2017. Um, we looked at the safety getting out of the driveways for sight lines. In both cases, it was fully met uh, for both driveways. You can clearly see over 600 feet look in each direction and then approaching both of those roadways. And we did our sake, I, I can't see yep. from here and then maybe Sorry. people in the back can see. Sure. So you're referring to the Chamberlain uh, 85. 85 and then uh, Wayland to West Main. Correct. And we also looked at Pleasant at both of those streets as well. In terms of to see if people would cut through that street or would they cut through a subdivision if it was left open. The people that cut through Pleasant now might would they? We want right. to see would they. That was a, a big question for Thank the process of the neighborhood. So as part of this project, when we looked at it, um, we assumed 34 units. Uh, we looked at uh, industry standards for single family homes and it produces approximately 30 trips during the morning and evening peak hours and about 300 trips, 324 to be exact, over the course of a day. As you can see in, in the morning, it was about 20 exiting seven entering and in the afternoon you have the opposite people coming home from work you have 21 coming in and 13 going out so it's not a significant traffic generator in terms of directional trip you're looking at one trip every three minutes going out in the morning and the same coming back in the peak hour in the afternoon can i ask you a question yep is that based on one vehicle per household it would generate during that peak hour approximately one vehicle per household that's, 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 that's what, that's what the, no. is that the standard that they have to question, which is, which is explain the standard that you're using to generate that and then so so this, we went out and counted there's uh, industry standards for in, ITE standards that basically says for single family homes they go out and count existing neighborhoods and the, the number of trips that they produce per single family home is going to be 26 for the 34 units during one hour in the morning, peak one hour. But that's based upon one vehicle per household. No. no. That, that's what they would relevant. generate during that one hour. They're going to generate 26 trips. So there's going to be 20, 20 people from that neighborhood going to leave the neighborhood, either by the West Main Street or out the Chamberlain. So combined. Okay. 
because not everybody leaves all at the same time. Some people go drop the kids off at school, some people go into work, some people work later, they work overnight. So on average, you're gonna generate 26 in the morning, 34 in the afternoon. Over the course of a the day, they're gonna produce 324 trips. So, so basically, let, let, me, let me clarify from beta. Do you guys agree with the source of his numbers and his numbers? Yes. Okay, so, so the traffic engineers in the room are all of the agreement that we're not talking nonsense. Okay. So we did next. We did a big question work. on the last. Yep. Does this include current Chamberlain Street, Wayland Street, and other? It does not include the existing neighborhoods. We, this we did our existing counts. We we're going to add these trips to them. So we're going to look at a future condition okay. with and without the project. Thank you. So in this hmm. case, we looked five years into the future and added um, approved projects for the town. So we looked at the Western Nursery, Lake Sea Farms Place. We looked at the entire development along Lumber Street, including the athletic center, the build out of the um, office parks, the Dunkin' Donuts on the corner of High Street at 2 High Street, um, Mosh Pinnock Woods, which is about 30 condo units across from South Street. So we looked at all these developments going in, plus a general background growth rate to cover any small developments that we may have missed. New school? New school we did add in. Um, we found out in the morning it doesn't really overlap. But we did, through a comment by Beta, look at a scenario where the two happened at the same time. Um, it was projected the school was approximately 9 o'clock in the morning they're going to start. The peak hour of the street that we looked at, which is much higher, was 7 to 8. But we did look at a scenario through a response to Beta that assumed they both line up. So we had to look at next is where are these, these trips going to go? So we looked at um, census data for journey to work. So about 50% of them are going to go to the 495, about 5% up Wood Street, 5% grow to 35 on Main, and then 5% down 85 to the south. So when you look at them, you basically have 14 trips going to 495, you have one trip on 85, uh, eight trips on Main Street, uh, two trips on Grove, and one up Wood. So it's a very small generator. Um, the afternoon is very similar, but they're coming back in. So that's a piece of that. <clears throat> All right, and then we looked at the cut through. Would they cut through into the site to go through eight, uh, West Main to 85, or would they continue to use Pleasant? So we looked at both of those scenarios that are a conventional plan. Under the emergency only plan, uh, people obviously wouldn't cut through, so that's a moot point. So the results basically came out in both directions. It's much quicker to continue on Pleasant, and it's mileage and time. So we didn't think people would cut through. Yes? So you know, at the last meeting we had with this open hearing, I um, asked someone to take a look at the intersection, including the intersection of uh, Chestnut and Hayden Row. Because right now, cars yes. wanting to avoid the school traffic in the morning coming off of Chestnut are going to turn south on Hayden Row yep. and go down to Granite and Lumber to get over to 495. If there's a cut through road, if, it, if it's a conventional plan, mm -hmm. the cars are now going to come up to either Teresa or Chamberlain, still avoid yep. the school traffic, and then make their way over to West Main Street. So our travel time study included uh, morning and afternoon runs with the school in place, and it's still going to be much faster to continue. Did you include the traffic, the traffic coming off of Chestnut? Yeah. It inclu it inc we, they drove through Chestnut to get there. So our travel time runs went from the site here, Chestnut's right here? No. Which Chestnut is south. South? So we basically did from the site comparison to here and then going through the site. So between the two of them, you'd have delay at both. So it's still much faster to go around. What about the traffic coming from south on 85 up before Chamberlain? It would still be quicker to go the conventional route. A question through the chair. Yeah. I don't mind. No then to cut through the it's site. Possible to take a left off Pleasant. Sure. So I mean, I'll t I take that. We, we, we did we did travel time during the peak, so we took the left off of Pleasant and 
went through a 20 mile school zone with the cops sitting there and, and was traffic so moving when you did that? Traffic was moving. The last day issue. And then what? certain times it wasn't. So a couple of the runs you went, you had a very long delay. So we, we know that Hayden Rowe has needs work and it's going to have work done and, and, and everything. But uh, through the chair, um, one of the neighbors who's here asked me uh, how feasible would it be to have uh, an improvement done to Chamberlain Street, for instance, where there's a left turn only uh, option where there's two lanes to exit Chamberlain, one going north, one going south, because a lot of traffic backs up already and these additional cars uh, add up. Uh, and maybe a, a different approach to, to these numbers would be to uh, have a, a little bit of an improvement to the situation. I, I think the intersection of Chamberlain and, and Hayden Road was taken by town meetings action as to what, you know, the, the town is in the process of studying that and you have an opportunity of money to go vote to fund that fully. But, but here we have a situation where it's specifically on Chamberlain Street and we have improvements that are being made and just like we dealt with Lumber Street, uh, who he well, rakes it, fixes it. Yeah, but I, I'm, I haven't heard yet that it's broken yet because the numbers that he's putting out, I don't think I'm hearing that it's Sorry, Mr. Chair. broken in. Yes. So I think the concerns in, in the crowd, if I have it correctly, are when we go up um, West Main Street, Traffic is backed up all the way down to the bottom of Wood Street. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, that you're concerned that they're going to go. You're concerned that it's backed up down the hill from Wood, the Wood Street signal here, yep. and then the signal up at uh, Main Street that it, they're basically going to cut through this way. Correct. Because <coughs> which was one of the because concerns. of the resistance to traffic. So we did an alternate scenario where um, we had 50 percent of the people cut through if they go each way, and like what would that case be? And it's still, uh, the intersections operated level service D or better. So it still wasn't a capacity problem. Um, the sight lines are fine. Uh, the other thing that we did notice is if you're coming from 495 side, why would you cut through to go to 85 south? You're essentially going back to Millbury. So I'm thinking the people are actually coming from Wood Street already. So uh, why are they going to go back? I think it should be <coughs> to get to all the schools. To so they're getting to the schools. So you're saying they're going to go around and then go this way. Because yeah. traffic's yeah. bad. So, is there, so our sorry. travel times are run said that it's pretty, I have the times that shows that it's, that, that path is a lot closer, but it is still considerably shorter distance and a little bit shorter time to actually go the other way, so. So if you have a 15 minute backup. So, so you're, you're, it's pretty close. You're looking at four minutes and 47 seconds in the morning versus five and a half. So right. about 40 seconds quicker in the morning. But if, you have, pleasant. but if you have a 15 minute backup on the main road, so, so, well, so we just hear me out for a second. Yeah. You have a 15 minute backup on the road. Then they there's, there's going to be a number of people through. that go the other way to avoid the traffic. I agree do you have any feel for how many that would <coughs> What percentage of people would do that? Yeah, like how many more trips would like, go through this neighborhood? Like Ken pointed out with the ways and technology does change the flow. Because people will cut through this neighborhood. It, that's, that's a fact. It's just a question of how many. So say under that worst case scenario that we never observed when we did our studies out there during the peak hours, I'll say if half of them did, you have 150 people, would be a reasonable, about 75 half. 75 cars, is that what you 75 cars. Okay, thank you. If That's you had that scenario, which we did not see. That sounds reasonable to me. We, we, did have de we did have the delay for the signal when we did the study. We did have the delay on the Pleasant, and then there's a, a slow speed zone through here to the cop always, every time we went out there a couple different days, the cop was sitting there, so you have to do 20 miles an hour, and then you had the signal delay here, and then you got to the schools. So just one more quick follow-up. So, so 75 coming heading south. Going this way. Would you say another 75 going the opposite way? It, heading north. I think it would be a lot less. You have about 100 people doing that during so the peak 15. hours, so it would probably maybe like 25 to 50. Okay. So we don't, that way is a lot. It's a lot longer to actually do that than to do that one. Do to the, the delay. Sure. Not uh, There's a lot of travel time. You Thank were you. very lucky that there was no accident on 495 and no traffic on the pike. Because if there's an accident on 495 or there's an accident on the pike or a backup on the pike, yeah. the numbers of people coming through the intersection goes up probably four times. Yeah. 
because so, my so, mother used to live off on you know, Sanctuary Lane off Chamberlain. I live on the other side of the road. It has taken me 45 minutes to get from the west side of Hopkinton to get to her in on Sanctuary Lane when there's been a backup. And at times, I took the Lumber Street Granite and it came around that way, and it was still 45 minutes to do it. So, so under that extraneous circumstances. Right, right, which is happening, if you look at how many accidents happen on 495, yes. I'm guessing we're probably in afternoon or evening, you're probably looking at one commute a week at least that that's happening. I think that number would be rather right. high, sorry. But. No, I, I wouldn't, I would, I would agree with you, John. So and and our right travel there. time runs also did not take into consideration the new layout that is a lot curvier that would, again, make you go even slower than the speeds that we assumed. The emergency connection option eliminates that completely. So I think it's also- Still behind behind. Yes. Gary, I should have better. Hey. Well, quickly, I, I live on Sanctuary Lane. Name, my name is Mike Cook. Um, if there were a continuous road, I wouldn't make a right turn on Chamberlain Street 100% of the time. Um, taking a left turn from Chamberlain Street on Hayden Row in the morning, it's not something to be desired. And the series of left turns that you have to take, um, and, and I might point out that people who take shortcuts tend to drive quickly on the shortcuts. <laughs> and think about that if we're talking about driving through residential uh, type roads. Okay, let me ask a couple of questions here. Are our traffic professionals from the peer review side in basic agreement with what we've just heard from a professional standpoint? No. Okay. <laughs> and then why don't Smart you answer. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Uh, Mike Wazaleski with the Beta Group. Um, I guess the, the trip generation uh, numbers that were discussed, we are in agreement with uh, that the, the number of new trips that will be generated by these houses follow uh, industry standard. Um, the one point that we disagree with is the, the travel time analysis and the, um, and the cut through analysis. Um, you know, our opinion follows with a lot of what I'm hearing here tonight that you know that there is a, a high potential for cut through traffic through this neighborhood um, one question I had actually additional question was what was the travel speed that was assumed when you were looking at the uh, the proposed routing it was the 30 mile an hour for the Chamberlain Wayland sections and then through the new subdivision since we're assuming a lot of traffic coming techniques that we I believe he used 20 to 25. Okay. 30, 30 miles an hour through Chamberlain and Wayland. Wayland? Yeah. I think Chamberlain. No, I, I, I think so. The green is what you said was 30, no, and, the and the red is. is what's that? The green was a different route. So yeah. The yeah. Speeds are we assumed on the main So road. along the red route, you assumed what speeds? So in, for the existing sections that are in to have. Uh, Prima facie speed of 30, we assume 30 miles an hour. Okay. And then through the new subdivision, which is going to have traffic calming and curved yeah, roads and other techniques, which haven't been fully addressed yet. I mean, you know that the town doesn't like certain things, they like other things. So, as far as the layout with the curvy road, we assume that would be 25 miles an hour. The study said 20 miles an hour. In your documentation on page 20, it said 20 miles an hour. 20 for just within the and, and what were the traffic calming features that, that you're proposing? The traffic calming features haven't been fully addressed yet. We're looking at a narrower low section and the, the, the curves. If I could just address that question, uh, I, I think that's speed bumps if the town likes speed bumps. Well, I think we're, we're all asking questions on a, on a proposal that none of us want to do. I think. Yeah. Similar to the wetland questions that were asked earlier, we don't want to cut through. That's not our proposal. We're at, we're at starting point A with this special permit at a concept level. We need direction from this board to either take a left and do a cut through road or take a right and do an open space without a cut through. That's going to answer all of these questions and it's going to answer 99% of the conservation questions. 
So I think we're looking to the board to, to, to give the residents ease that the cut through road is simply just to determine the number of lots that could eventually be built. Okay. Let, let, me, see if, let me see if I can summarize that because it's probably a very good point. Does anyone want to see the cut through road built? Raise your hand. <laughs> 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 okay, so so basically, that's the feedback we're getting. Is as if everyone spent their two minutes at the microphone saying that. Uh, I wanted to spend my two minutes. <laughs> just just one second. Uh, then the next question for the traffic folks: If you don't do the, the cut through road, the intersections with just the additional 32 units, both the intersections are that now would be considered adequate from a uh, traffic where, I don't know, what, 10 goes to one out Wayland Street and what do we do? Just whatever. If you want to see how they're split, we have them split. Just okay, go just, ahead. Just for your, just now that you're on that topic. So with the numbers that we put, there's about 10 trips in the morning that are going to go in and out of the Wayland Road, about 16 out the other side. We had about 13 units off one side, and the rest of them were off of Chamberlain. And about three so those are those are additional. Those are new units. No. So there's about 21 units used were on Chamberlain, and there was 13 on Wayland. And if you add that to the existing that traffic, that's existing upstairs. So you have about 50 trips coming out of Chamberlain in the morning, and there'll be about 20 trips going out of Wayland. What, what is the time for this? Seven to nine, seven to eight in the morning. Seven to eight. Which is the peak between seven to nine. So it's the peak commuter period in the morning. So 50 trips in that hour? Correct. There's about 40 left turns and we estimate about 10 right turns. So about On to Hayden Road. About one per minute, yeah. How many of those are existing? existing? Plus. Plus. That's, that's what you might want to make that. Yeah, so it's existing plus the. Well, so what is it now? Like what's, what's, can you tell us what additional traffic? Yeah, well, so there's, less, there's 50 less. trips minus 16. Especially minus 12, sorry. 38. There's 38 trips going out of Chamberlain today, and we're going to add 12. And then going out the other street, we have, there's 13 existing trips, and we're adding 7. Is that per day? For one hour in the morning. One hour in the morning, okay. One hour period. And then most of the trips will be coming back in the afternoon, so this is what it looks like in the afternoon. So coming back 12, and then you have 14 trips exiting, and then 22 exiting Chamberlain in the afternoon. Most of the trips again coming back. Most of them on Grove, you have 38, and then come back from the highway, you have about 12. During the peak hour? And that's existing plus the 32 units. One hour. It's 4.30 to 5.30 is the Do you have a question? Yes. Can come up to the mic, please. <coughs> India Nolan, I live at 26 Chamberlain Street. I have for 26 years. And when I moved up to Chamberlain Street, we didn't have Angelo Drive, we didn't have Sanctuary Lane. And it's all worked out well. But I'm telling you, when we <clears throat> stopped three developments behind us until Sanctuary Lane, one of the things was the traffic study that was huge. Because you take, you know, you say thir 32, homes are only going to generate with what we have coming in, out of uh, Sanctuary Lane and all of Chamberlain Street is only going to generate how many trips? Uh, well, only the new 32 units. So? They'll generate because we have 20. So the 32 units 32. are only, how many people are only going out? We have, we have, we have 34. In that one hour period. So, so going, going out in the morning, one hour, we have 19 total in the morning. Added to what we have. And 21. So you add it together. So in the morning, you could have a total of 50 trips coming out of Chamberlain if you're coming out of Wayland. Total existing plus the units, you can have 20. If you're assuming that, that not everybody has two cars and they're not all leaving, you're, you're taking 32 homes and saying 16 maybe. That's the industry standard, that's correct. Well, I don't think that's very realistic. For a one-hour period? Well, I, 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 we, we've had this peer review, right. and, you know, that part I think they all agreed with. And, you know, only 19 of the units 
are coming out the Chamberlain side, the other ones are coming out of the Wayland side without through, the open space. The board, I believe the only left issue with, through beta for the traffic was the cut through. That was the only outstanding issue that they haven't uh, signed off on. I think everybody's in the group with that. I, I, I know. And, you know, a one hour period, okay? So, but I'm thinking of the whole day. And I'm thinking about the fact that we have no sidewalks. And we have kids all up and down the street. So, I'm not happy with all of this extra traffic coming through at all. Chair, just one follow-on comment on that. Yeah. Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but we are going to talk about sidewalks. So obviously, oh, well, well, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so when we do get to that point, we're obviously going to try to protect protect the residents and the kids by adding sidewalks. So we need to work through that. So we'll see you next then. I get a sidewalk. <coughs> oh. Okay, let's. Uh, <laughs> Let's use the available time to kind of step through a few of the other outstanding ones at this point. Uh, from a process standpoint, basically because there's such a turnover on the board, that this will probably be refiled as a new hearing at the, when, when the after the election. And I think it'd be the best time to kind of go through some of these other items on the, on the step. Uh, so, stormwater management. Uh, we typically put in a couple of conditions at this, this phase, and that stormwater management is normally really addressed at the definitive subdivision. As everyone knows, it's a two-step process. We approve the concept. Then they go off and do all the additional um, regulations. But basically, we do uh, require the Massachusetts DEP stormwater regulations, and uh, it fully complies with, with that, and, and our, also our subdivision regulations for stormwater management. Um, and basically, we, we put together a few conditions on that area but it's really just handled with the, uh, the Massachusetts stormwater regulations primarily. Correct. And at that definitive stage all, all uh, infrastructure will be designed to meet the town's and state standards for stormwater cleaning, retention, uh, and release back into the, into the streams. And then for utilities, just to gloss over that tonight. Uh, <coughs> We urge you to apply for a water, town water service. We will be doing that as well. I don't believe that you would be required for fire cisterns on this because of the length of hose that, with the hydrants that are at the end of each road. But we'll, we'll talk more about that. Yeah. I, I think we're all, all set on that. I, I believe it's in our, our rules and regulations for the number of feet from the. Okay. Um, also, the utilities. Uh, what, what kind of bedroom count are you looking for? These four, four. Bed, four bedroom Correct. units. Okay. On both sets of plans? Yes. I thought I heard something smaller at the beginning. We've always been four bedroom, roughly 3,000, 3,500 square feet. Smaller lots. Lots, right. But still supporting that size house. Right. I think there'll have to be some more discussion on uh, nitrogen loading, etc. I believe it is allowed to use open space for credit. You believe? Okay. Yes, I looked into that today. You what? I looked into that today. And okay. I believe it is allowed. Yeah. Okay, so the open space yeah. basically is allowed in that area. Okay. The uh, trail connections, it's clear that 
basically there's been some rerouting on the open space of them, but basically the existing trails are maintained in that particular plan. Correct. Yeah, we're going to try to minimize the, the number of trail crossings with the open space layout. Obviously, we can save 50% uh, of the property. Uh, the, the majority of the trails will be saved, and then the minimum trails that we will intersect with the new roads or, or lots will be uh, rerouted, and, and uh, we will blaze new paths to, to be to close the gaps. impacts. I'm not sure what we've met in, the, in that area. I mean, obviously, there's turning radiuses. We, you know, the school had to like their bus Okay. Chair, can I ask a question about the trails? Yeah, go ahead. So, folks, there's trails. It looks like the solid lines are where the trails have been moved to. Correct. So, what about the one that's running east to west, up top? What, what map are you looking at, please? The open space plan. So, you can see on the right part of the page that the dotted lines are going across mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. home's property, so they've been moved to the right. Mm -hmm. And up at the top middle, yep. instead of going through the cul-de-sac, it's been moved to the left. Yep. But what about the east-west route, that one going across the top? Yeah, we could we could rewrite that just to the north of the Old Stone Foundation. Okay, you just did a pencil in Correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. We just added that buffer zone with yeah. the, um, with okay. the plant, yeah. so we can route it through there. Thanks. Okay. Good. Oh, yes. Uh, Jane Moran, uh, 70 East Main Street. And I just have one, um, by the way, the trails look really great. There is one trail that at dead ends, all the others have contiguity and meet most of the roads, are able to cross in. And there is this one trail that comes down Chamberlain through the back of uh, 2625 and then kind of dead ends. Would there be any way to bring that over to the road or one of the? Yeah, if you notice, um, we are gonna continue the path north to south Mm -hmm. so that it does connect to the road from the high school property. Yep, and um, one of the lessons we learned working with uh, Legacy Farms is that the trails themselves are pretty good, but that they don't connect to the new neighborhoods. And we found that the new neighbors would really like to use those trails. And people coming through also would like they don't like dead ends, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So if we could just look at them and sure, make sure absolutely. that none of them dead end, that would be absolutely. appreciated. Sure. Thank you. So I think what, what we've heard is we can move the one behind lots 26 and 27 around mm -hmm. and, and go through that open space. Mm -hmm. Or actually, maybe if you could, depending on what's on the ground, go more towards the the school property side of that right. as, as to provide as much backyard in, mm -hmm. for that area. Um, and then Jane's other point was more interconnection somewhere. If, I guess you got one right in the middle. Could I do a check? Yeah, go ahead. Um, how do we how do we determine easement for trails to people's property once they're once they own it? Not, none of them will be. The, none none of all of the trails will be on own open space. Okay. Muriel. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I had two not really questions, but just uh, food for thought going forward. Um, as of Monday, we'll be considering the traffic calming on Hayden Row. So when we do come back, if the engineers, the traffic engineers, can wrap that into whatever analysis they do. Um, the other question I had, I sort of missed my moment. I got onto the access road. Um, but Mr. Tedstone was asking about the turning radius at the end of Chamberlain. Um, at the site walk, we had talked about <coughs> Chamberlain being an irregular road. Um, and you would, Mr. Paul, you had followed up with a question about the stone walls. Um, we had talked about marking the center point because it's not necessarily the center point that you see um, and marking what at least the minimum 20 feet 
would be so people can actually have a visual of what it's going to mean um, to their property along that the end of Chamberlain and that turning radius. That's a great point through you, Mr. Chair. I think they were going to mark all the way down Chamberlain Street. What's the request for this, right? <coughs> to see where yeah, the, so the property was. As part of the definitive design, uh, we're going to be locating everybody's property out there. We're, we're going to spend a lot of time on Chamberlain Street, locating all stone walls, all trees, diameters. Um, and minimizing any impact to those uh, frontages along Chamberlain Street. This level concept plan does not show that at this point, uh, but we will take into consideration all stone walls, uh, and it, we won't necessarily use the center point of Chamberlain Street and just say 10 feet on either side will be paved. We'd like to me meander and keep as many trees and natural features as we can when we're out there. We're going to try to minimize any stone wall disturbance. If there's any stone walls that, that just can't be avoided. Uh, we will keep the stones and, and rebuild the walls in different locations. Three, three, Mr. Chair, I yeah. think the point was to stake with red flags on each side of Chamberlain Street, so people wouldn't be surprised, so that they could see yeah, so where the property line is. Correct, and that that level of design will be done as part of the definitive design. Okay. When roughly when will we expect the we, we, we need we need a, a special permit approval okay. prior to. So it'll be some time. I just want to set yes. expectations. It won't be. In the near future, probably in late room. fall. I'm okay. assuming. Thank you. Okay, I think we're just about ready to wrap this up for tonight. We have several other business items we have to get done tonight. Uh, at this point, what, what where should we continue this hearing to? Uh, out a couple of days. I mean, we've got a lot of work with the Conservation Commission. That's okay. Right. So, uh, Well, we do is make uh, June 12th. Uh, we have that formal um, conversation with somebody on the 10th after. Let's make it 8 o'clock. Entertain a motion to continue the public hearing to June 12th. Uh, so moved. Second. Uh, further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Uh, Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Okay, so we're off. We've got some business to do, so if you want to talk, please do it way outside the room, please. Can you have a question for the audience? Can you explain just what happened in terms of like what you decided, uh, where you're going to, you know, where it's going from here? Obviously, we have a, an election can you just explain that to all of us? Sure. This, this permit to be issued has to have an affirmative, affirmative vote of six members of the planning board. As a minimum, there's only six people, there's three of us that aren't running again, so those won't be on the board. What I suspect will happen in the next couple of weeks, the applicant will withdraw this permit and refile it. As it turns out, the, if, unless you've been at every one of the hearings as a board member, or if you've listened to it on tape, then you can vote on it. So basically, we require pretty good attendance of the board members. So the probability of him getting six board members uh, after the election to all vote in favor of it is more difficult than not. So I suspect to get a full slate of board members, he will withdraw it and then resubmit. And does it start all over? It starts all over from day one. Uh, you, have, you have continued it. But we have continued at this point because we have not withdrawn it. At the end of every hearing, we have to continue it to a time certain. But if he withdraws it, which is what the most logical thing is that he's going to do, then uh, or or maybe he won't withdraw it in hopes it gets voted down, and then you get the conventional side. <laughs> But I, I, anyway, so, so that's where it's at. So the, the board, the next meeting is June 12th on this topic. As it stands. If it's not withdrawn. Right. <coughs> Thank you, folks, for all coming tonight. I appreciate it. We've got a lot of work to do. So, Phil, you're going to stick around, please. Phil, can you stick?
six. I don't know. We're not going to be here after the election. Mathematically, it's five. And the only other one would be Ken, who could be here. So there would only be, yes, one, two, three, four, three, four. I want it to fail. Okay, board members. I don't want it to fail. I really like the, 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 the uh, guard rails. I like the let's, uh, let's go into the right turn lane on Lumber Street. We have a proposal hmm. uh, from... Uh, I don't have any paperwork. From Beta. I didn't see anything in the package. We received really? several other proposals. You didn't see the PDF. The lowest says, price no. one. All it was was uh, and, and it was responses. like 300 pages. I think you saw the comments that from both John Westerling and David Dottario. And uh, this would allow us to get the engineering and the the engineering and the uh, cost estimate to be done. We have about a half to a third in our mitigation funds that we received when uh, the 110 grill project was built. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also mitigation money that was offered by the, the Muse that the selectmen control, which quite frankly, I think this project would be a good use of that given that they really caused the problem. I mean, and uh, this is the first step. We also have $4,500 of budget from last year that we kind of squirreled away for this. And we might even have some budget from this year that if we could spend it soon, by that 4500 we have to get that. Right, so we're looking to try to, to get a significant part of the, the preliminary design advanced. Early on, and we need the survey. We got the survey, so that's part of it. That'll take care of a lot of the money we have to spend by a certain time, and then we'll get the preliminary design done, and then you know a lot of the other stuff will be done when the project keeps going forward. But basically, once we get the cost estimate, then we know where we have to go for this. So, are there any other further questions on this? You know, this is a this is a critical piece that we need to get done because what it allows us to do, you know, as soon as the muse starts filling up, that queue is going to be back up to 495 on a certain couple of times a year mm -hmm. or a couple of times a week. For, for our television studio studio audience, uh, where are we with um, the uh, golf uh, sign being moved in that? Lane? That would be part of the, our scope to move that. So, yes, we would. But there's an agreement with the uh, We, we have them. an easement from that uh, already from golf, and we have the easement from uh, the Cumberland Starbucks. Farms? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Same. Yep. So we have both those easements. The town meeting's already accepted them a year ago. So we're all set to go once we get this engineering started. So any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to uh, award the design scope uh, for the West Main Street and Lumber Street right turn lane to the Beta Corporation per their proposal based on the 24th of April. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstained? Motion carries. And that's to come out of the 4500 from Right. Last year, and run the rest out of the mitigation, or, or, or if, other if, engineering. If, if you if you have other if we have engineering funds for, for this fiscal year, apply them, year. apply them, apply first. them, and then take the balance. Yes. Okay. The mitigation we've got that squirreled away. Sure. So. Okay. The chair. Yeah. And a uh, semi-related editorial comment, just as we look at things. Um, Coming out of 77 West Main, uh, basically by Bank of America, either I'm hitting people 
Uh-oh. Who are the Infrigor okay. ones or but almost, <laughs> I see almost on a daily basis people coming out and making the left turn and ignoring the sign. <laughs> No, I hope. <laughs> so just as a reference, the is physical barrier gone that was there before. People I'm are just coming out, making the left. Left turn out of. Sorry, the traffic study doesn't support that. Yeah. <laughs> coming out of uh, uh, Seventy West, West Main. Well, I mean, just talking about the intersection. Oh, to to that point, there are also people making left turns coming out of the new Starbucks and Unibank Plaza too onto West Main. I've well, seen that as well. That's even worse. That is that is worse, that is especially worse. since yeah. we put that we put that little tri we made sure they have that triangle in there to try and make sure that they're, they're directed over to the right. Triangle. Yes, I know. That's well, what I see. Well, maybe maybe right. we need to do some ask the police department. Well, they put the parking space in. <laughs> can, Jennifer, can you kind of take that on? I can do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's see. Town meeting follow up. We batted a hundred percent. It's yes. not bad. That's very yeah. good. And thanks for thanks, all, and all the support that Thank we you. had. You uh, did. I mean, there was a couple of interesting ones and a, a lot of good discussion, but basically, I think the process of zoning advisory committee and working with the planning board to do incremental changes once again proved that there's the right way to do it. In, you know, along with that, this is also the time that we thank the members of the Zoning Advisory Cl Committee. And um, did you just, you were going to make individual letters? I got one from John. Um, last year we only sent one to the chairman, but if you want individual letters, I could do that. Why don't, why don't we do individual letters? Okay. And thank everyone. Since we were down from 19 to 13. To what? Do you want me to call you when they're ready to come in and sign them? I'll be happy to come in and sign them. Sure. How many members are there? Nine. <laughs> Which is Plus. better than last year when we started out with 15 and went all the way down to 13. Okay. Yeah. It, so. it may not be till late tomorrow. Well, I it's, it's when, it is whenever. I mean, we'll thank them when, when we get around to it, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Through so. the chair about Tom Meany. Um, I, th I think Mike Shepard made a very good point about uh, one of the articles, uh, which to me means that maybe I, I didn't have enough information in the planning board session talking about it, uh, but that article passed. Um, and then talking about our other things going on, I just wanted to uh, give Ken an apology about one of the comments I had made. Uh, I did read in the paper that there was a unanimous vote, but I was shown in the minutes uh, from uh, the um, CCP uh, conservation, what is, what's it? Community preservation. Community preservation. CPC, that you did indeed vote no. Uh, you were a sole vote no, which I can relate to, and I appreciate that. And uh, so it's, you don't always believe what you read in the news. And uh, Well, I had to, when I saw it in the news, I had to go back and check the minutes myself to make sure that I got recorded correctly. But it, it was. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And, uh, and also, uh, while we're here, I want to thank Vinny. You've been a really good member. And I know you started out in a hail of fire, but you've really hung in there and, and you stood yeah, up and you say what you think and I appreciate that and Matt longtime members it's been a pleasure working with you and thank you likewise and you too Frank and stuff we'll see you and, and Brian you've been also great to work with and we're replacing you with your wife that might be the better deal better <laughs> and Ken good, good luck you, you're, you're up for a re-election so it's uh We'll see. It's, it's, it's very good that we have so many candidates. It's the first year we've had a contested election for planning board. It's good. Since the year 2010. Yep. Okay. Now, let's get down more to the agenda. Nice. We've got a minutes for April 12th, 2017. Wow. Did everyone read the minutes? I did. Are there any corrections to the minutes? I didn't see it. Well, I got a few. I didn't know we had a packet. Must have gone. Well, think about them. Oh, they did send out. And, and, and by the way, we they gave you a couple of very good no, shout outs over the I last week for minutes, both at uh, I think town meeting. Yes. Yes. I'm not that sensitive. 
And she was there. No, good. but you were there. You, and, you did and, and I think your name even came up in vain at one of the candidate speeches too. So uh, oh, I'm trying did to remember. Did you? 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 Especially with uh, up news, right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, the changes I have. Okay. Well, page six, and I'll give them to you all. Oh, okay. All right. I'll give this to uh, Page six, you ended the sentence with a with a uh, oh, comma. with a comma instead of a period. <laughs> wow. And then wow. on page it's seven, nitpicking. Uh, there's another scribbler's word. There's a, an extra M in the minutes somewhere. Yep. And on page, page eight. <laughs> Spell check. Uh, Failure. Don't, everything will stay, <laughs> stay the name. It should be probably the same. So we got one, one word off. And uh, then yeah. uh, there's at the top of the page, and it's kind of, it reads a little funny. And instead of saying an idea, her answers. And read the new master plan to, to, to get her answers, and it was part of the discussion. So. Those are, the, those are the amendment I put forward. So I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes as amended. As amended. So, so moved. Second. So moved and seconded. Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Uh, uh, anyone uh, opposed? Anyone uh, hold on, hold on, Frank. Carried. I'm abstaining. I, I, through the water problems with town hall, whatever, uh, I, I still haven't been able to find the minutes, and I'll, I'll catch up. I'm sure they're fine. Okay. They're all the way at the end of that packet I signed you. 120 pages. Yep. Okay. Why didn't you print it, Paul? Yeah. We're going all electronic for now until Town Hall is back up and running. I think we should keep that permanently going forward, Jan. Yeah, I like that plan. I, I don't like that plan. Print your own copies. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> print your own copies. No. no. Yeah. Oh, yeah? If, if, member really think so? if a member wants a printed package, That's we're going to provide. Right. I just joking because all I care about is myself. <laughs> <laughs> and we recorded that. Excellent news. Okay. Um, let's see. There's two other comments I had about town hall flooding. I think mm -hmm. it's very ironic that the flood started it with the Conservation Commission. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was remarking to Kobe that our Dutch girl didn't come in and plug the dike. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I guess we share some of the, the problem. But is there any word on, have you guys been in there recently? Not recently. I've, I've heard it's pretty well cleaned up and they've got a contractor that's going to start soon to start putting it back together. Uh, yeah, last time we saw pictures that were in there, it was pretty much down in studs. So it's pretty, pretty tore up right now. Will it be done before the library? No. <laughs> When's well, the library will be done? Next June. No, like fall. No, library is the summer sometimes. You shut sure. fall, I think. I thought it was fall, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we're going to be out at least four to six months. Question about the town meeting? It's yes. Six. I had to leave early the second night, I believe it was, and we as the planning board did not support the, the junk article, right? So did that get approved, I think? Yes, it did. Was there a lot of debate? Yes, there was. There was also a modified version of what you saw. Okay. Exactly what you okay. looked at. It was, it was a little more reasonable, I think. It's only construction debris. Okay. Yep. It's brought in. That's brought in. Right, okay. It's right. not considered art. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, entertain a motion to adjourn. Um, I just, I just oh, have one comment. First, I just want to say thank you, uh, several thank yous. Thank you first to the citizens of Hopkinton for electing me uh, to the planning board six years ago. I've really appreciated my time on the board. And thank you uh, to my fellow planning board members and also the board of selectmen for appointing me for that extra year to finish the work that we had started uh, on Legacy Farms North. Uh, and I was glad to be able to see that through. Uh, I do want to also uh, say I really do appreciate my time uh, serving on this board with a very diverse group of uh, members in the last six years. Diversity comes in all ways, forms, and shapes, and uh, the different ideas and the different backgrounds have really uh, done this town a service. Uh, 
by bringing our individual thoughts and questions and ideas to this board and I'd like to see that continue. You're welcome and thank you for everything that you've done with us. You've done for the town. You're welcome. Don't be a stranger. You're an alumni. Back, He's an alumni too. And I'd like to second Frank's <laughs> recognition of, of uh, Vincent and our good friend here. And uh, going forward, um, uh, we hope to see you guys around a little bit more, maybe. Oh, yeah. We'll be out there mm -hmm. watching. Yeah, yeah. Um, and <laughs> I wish you in line. Ken good luck on the on moving forward as well. Okay, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Speech. Moved. No. Do I hear a second? A second. 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 All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Anyone want to stay here? Say no. <laughs> say bye. Adjourn.